Bible says the message of the cross is foolishness. 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 Foolishness to those that are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Hey, you guys, what is going on? This is Brian Sumner. Welcome to the Foolishness Podcast. Just got back from an amazing three or four day trip to Canada in men's ministry, outreach at the skate park, preaching in a newly planted church by my buddy, Pastor Dave Johnson. You heard him on here a few episodes ago, almost died in a plane accident. His friend did. His two other friends survived. God spoke to him. God is using him. He wants to use all of us. But as you know, I've been filling in at a local Calvary Chapel, Calvary Chapel of the Pacific Coast, five, ten minutes from my house, maybe 15. I've said I'm committed to going through James for them while the Lord shows us what he is doing in that community. I say that to say thank you for those who tune in who partner with me. I'm getting to jump into the pulpit every week and I am loving it. I'm about to study this whole week to present the next part of James. But for now, uh, share, like, get it out to people. I love being this scouser, living in America, doing this kind of ministry after my skate career, though I'm still out skating a bit. But to do this, I get to share with you the word of God. Here it is. Hope it blesses. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, right, bro? <laughs> How are you guys doing? <laughs> guys, I got to say something pretty crazy and funny about Harvest Festival, all right? And my wife can testify to this. At one time, my sister was flying in from England with my nephew, and my sister's not a believer. And so she lands in LAX, and I tell my sister, Elaine, I'll send her the sermon afterwards, forgive me, Elaine, but I'm not really repenting. I said, I've got to go meet with some people real quick. They're going to be playing some music. I picked her up at LAX. We drove down to Harvest Festival. We pulled up to the Angel Stadium. <laughs> First touchdown in America with jet lag. Was listening to Harvest for about three hours. Amen? Amen. It was beneficial. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the day, for this house, for this church, for the word of God. Lord, as you speak to us today, minister and move. The world is in a crazy place, but as crazy as ever, yet the Spirit is at work to convict, to bring life, to bring grace and mercy. And Lord, I just pray blessings over your people, over these scriptures, over this word. We pray and say, in Jesus' name, today and we're going along, James, and it's going to be a pretty teachy message. We started a week or so ago. I'm going to be away next week up in Canada. Be praying for me. Outreach, skate event, men's ministry, all the rest. Then I'm going to be back and we're right into this. But as I said, it's going to get pretty teachy. James came to us last week, James 1, and he's the half-brother of Jesus. This is James the Just. This is James who was a pillar in the early church. He was raised with Jesus. Him and his other brothers and sisters didn't believe, didn't trust in who Jesus was until many years later. We unpacked last week how James, Jesus appeared to him once he was resurrected. Jesus appeared to over 500, many of whom were still alive. James was a pillar in the early church. He was known for his prayer. They said in church history his legs had welts like that of a camel because he spent so many hours in prayer. He was known as James the Just. And this is James who was thrown from the temple, didn't die, and while on the floor, probably crippled or who knows what, this is our brother in Christ who was martyred. They beat him to death with clubs. Why do I say that? Because as we read this today, it isn't just Sunday. Some guy called Brian, T.K. Berger. Yes, God bless you. Happy birthday, Pastor Ron. Amen? Amen. But this is a book from one of our brothers who was martyred, who died for his faith, who was raised with Jesus. Who, If he walked in here now, I would sit down and say, tell us about what matters most. That's what we're reading from. We can take these five chapters and apply them to our lives. We can leave different from the way we came in. How is James written? You'll hear it carries a lot of the Sermon on the Mount. You'll hear that it bleeds the Beatitudes. He was around Jesus. He was listening to his teaching. James has been called a book of Proverbs for the New Testament. And I say that to you to say we are called to mature. We are called to grow. We are called to take this and apply it. 
And last week, what did we cover? I'll cover real quick from James 1 and 2. He says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And many of you said, Brian, we're going through it right now. Life is crazy. There's struggles with the family. There's struggles with this and that. And he says, count it joy because you know that the testing of your faith produces patience. He said, if any of you lack wisdom, ask of God. We made that cheesy pastor joke, amen? Don't go to the phone, go to the throne, meaning when you're going through it, call upon the Lord and say, I need wisdom. And we finished last week in verse 6, 7, 8. But when you ask, church, ask in faith, don't doubt. Ask in faith for wisdom and believing. Why? Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. If we come in here with doubt, if we don't trust, if we don't believe, you're just like that wave, and it's moved by the groundswell. It's moved by the wind. It's moved from a text. It's moved from an offended family member. It's moved by the flesh. No. This is Calvary Chapel. We are, we are in Christ. Amen. We're going to be grounded in him alone. We're going to trust and abide. And so with that, James suddenly switches gears. As I said, it's about maturity. It's about wisdom. And so we'll begin to read in verse 9 of 1. And he's focusing on the perspective of the poor and the rich, life under trials, and qualities we need as we walk through trials. It says in verse 9 that the lowly brother glory in his exaltation but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers with the grass and its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes, so the rich man also will fade away in all of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures under temptation, for when he has been approved he will receive of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. He focused on certain things last week, and it seems like he's switching gears dramatically, but really, James writes in a way where he bounces all around. Remember that last week he's writing to the 12 tribes of Israel who have left the city because persecution is on the rise. This isn't Daniel's day where they're exiled to Babylon and there's that kind of persecution. This is Herod opposing. This is the Apostle Paul killing our brothers and sisters. This is the church last week, people are being killed. The church next week, maybe today they're bursting through the doors. That was his focus, count it all joy. And now he switches gears to speak in the practical where some of us will be able to relate immediately. He says in verse 9, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. Let those who don't have much, those who lack, maybe those who are lowly or those who are poor, and you could say to yourself, am I lowly, am I poor, am I middle class, or am I rich? This can relate to everyone. Let those who feel lowly relate and glory in what? In what Christ has done. Even as the band was sharing, even as Graham was sharing, if you are going through the struggles, if you say, this is my lot in life, I'm just lowly, what he's telling them is you should remember your salvation. You should wake up each day and be realizing this is the day the Lord has made. Amen. Glory in the cross. Glory in what he has done. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. When you consider that and you realize life is a vapor, let's fast forward into eternity. Will you look back at your life and consider it that much? No. 
We'll be so focused on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We'll be focused on what he did for us, on the work of the cross. But the reality is when most of us sit with people on a lunch break or at a holiday or around someone, and you ask how life is, what do they focus on? The negative. They focus on what's wrong. They focused on the issues. They focus on the family they were raised in or were not. They focused on the things they don't have. And why this is dangerous is you think about the Bible, you think about Genesis. What did God do? He created everything and he saw that it was what? Preach it, amen? Got some preachers in here. He made it all, saw that it was good, but he said, Adam and Eve, enjoy it all. Eat of all. You know what? That tastes really good. Go try that. You know what? The animals, they don't kill you. You know what? You can live this radical life for eternity with me. I've given you all of this. He saw that it was good, but there's just one thing I don't want you to do. You just can't touch this. You just can't eat of this. They focused on what they couldn't have rather than what God had provided for them. Amen. And you and I are still no different. If only I looked like this, or if only I had that, if only if these opportunities were here, Lord, God is sovereign, amen? If you're feeling lowly, consider God knows exactly what he is doing. And if you look at most people when they consider their lives, are we really content here? People who are single, they all want to be what? Married. And many who are married, oftentimes, they want to be what? Don't look at your spouse, amen? I'm kidding, there's grace and mercy. You know, I put a book out years ago called Love Never Fails about marriage. We were going to call it Death by Marriage. And people laugh, but isn't that what marriage is? Less of me, more of him. I must decrease, he must increase. Best bit of marriage advice I ever heard was, would you marry yourself? That'll preach, amen. This is why I have notes. But my point is this. We live in a world where we want what we don't have. The wealthiest want one more dollar. The prettiest need to get more things done to their face to feel prettier. Those who are the greatest at athletics, they want one more shot or one more pill just to beat the record. But the Bible says godly contentment is what? And you say, Pastor, I'm content. No, I'm content when all the ducks line up. I'm content when the kids aren't fighting. I'm content when the, the service is over and we're celebrating Jesus. I'm content when I've controlled everything in my life and it looks good. That's not being content. Can I be lowly and be content with what the Lord has provided? Can I be lowly and be content in all that the Lord has? You know, the reason I don't do the lottery, nothing against the lottery, amen, is because if I need millions of dollars, God will give them to me. I need to be able to say, Lord, I trust you with whatever's in my bank account. I trust you with the family I have. I trust you with all that's in your hand. Why? Because Philippians 4.19, this is Paul. Look at how he says it. He's saying, Brian Calvary, my God shall. He's even saying, your God. You want me to boast in Christ? Yes, Paul, tell me. My God, Brian, shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Am I in Christ? Then I have exactly what I need for today. Amen? James goes on in 4.2. Don't go there, but listen. He says, but you do not have because you do not ask. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask what? Amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. What he's telling you is you can be so focused on what you don't have that you're asking for the wrong reasons. And what James is saying by call the lowly to be exalted in the way they think, be content with where the Lord has placed you. Be content where the Lord has you. When you don't have a law, be thankful for eternity with Jesus because then he switches gears, verse 10, which is a radical verse. He says, the rich should glory in his humiliation. The rich should glory when they are humbled. He doesn't say glory in your riches. He doesn't say glory in your wealth. You can be thankful if you are wealthy. Amen? He doesn't say glory in your options. What he's saying is when your foundation is shaken, when you are the CEO, when you are the business owner, when everyone nods their head yes to you on the day you get challenged or the bottom falls out, be thankful the Lord is reminding you don't trust in riches. Don't trust in what the world is selling. Don't trust in all that we see that's out there, that's shiny, that glitters as gold. Amen? Amen? We all know CEOs. We all know business owners. We all know the rock stars and the famous this and the famous that. The surfers who won the Pipeline Pro only to walk back to the car with some plastic trophy saying, this is it. What he's saying is, whether you're lowly, be excited about your faith. And whether you're rich, be thankful when you are humbled. 
you know, I'm, I don't like to think of myself as a poser. I mean, I was a professional skater. I try and take care of things in life, amen? But on a guitar, I am absolutely a poser. When I see these guys playing, when I talk to these guys, when I see what they can do, and in conversation they'll talk about, I know this guy from Fender, and I know this person and that person. Was it Leo Fender, the guitar guy, amen? Leo owned Fender, but did he really own it? Tony Hawk on the companies I rode for, did he really own them? Well, Calvary, we have this property. Do we really have this property? Or is it all just borrowed? Is it all just dirt? Did it come from dirt into dirt? It shall what? Return. All of this is the Lord's. No one owns anything. Are we storing up riches and treasures here? Or are we depositing them into eternity? He's saying, let the lowly rejoice in salvation. Let the rich be thankful when they're humble. Why? Because money can be a dangerous thing in this sense. 1 Timothy 6.17 I've known many wealthy people who cannot open their fist to give to ministry to support what God is doing because they've thought so much about money that money's become their God. Yet Paul writes to us in 1 Timothy 6, 17. He says, command, not just suggest. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust in the uncertain riches, but in the living God. Amen. Who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come. James's echo in Jeremiah 9, 23, listen to this. Don't let the rich man glory in his riches, okay? But let him glory that he understands and knows me. Wherever you are right now, is Jesus enough? Is being in church enough? Is him providing food today enough? Whatever you've lost in your life, don't look back to the good old days. Look forward to glory. This is what James is saying. Because we all know the verses, amen? We can't serve two masters, Matthew 6, 24. You cannot serve God and mammon, God and anything. Bible tells us, Matthew 6, 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where the thieves can break in and steal and in verse 21 he says where your treasure is there your heart will be also what James is simply saying is hey this persecution some of you are being put to death but what are you trusting in if you don't have a law be thankful for Jesus if you have everything don't trust in it instead focus on the Lord why verse 10 because as a flower of the field that man that woman they're going to pass away No sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat that it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes, and so the rich man or woman also will fade away in his pursuits. He's using something practical. He's talking about the marshlands maybe and seal beets or the, the beautiful foundations around us. He's speaking of the flowers that are in Jerusalem that rise up from February but are burned up by May. He's talking about the lush green fields with the beautiful green grass. And he's saying, this is what it's like when we trust in the things of the flesh. Don't hold to wealth. Don't hold to riches. Guys, you you see the deception in the world, right? You better own it. You better be the CEO. You better make the commands. You better be in charge. Money never sleeps. And when you think about the Ten Commandments, what the Sabbath's really about, it's about rest. But it's also about man not trusting God. We need to gather all the quail today, and God says, no, don't you trust me. The reason we don't steal is because if I needed that, God would give it to me. So much of the practicality of the Ten Commandments is practical wisdom. And here, James is saying, don't focus in that. Focus on God. And by the way, some who heard this would be persecuted, would be put to death. How do we do this, James? Look at what he says in verse 12. He switches gear now to what we're going to face. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved. What does that verse say to you? Blessed are you when you endure, for when he has been approved. Haven't we been approved? Aren't we in Christ? Aren't we covered by the blood? James, you're messing with my theology here. I mean, aren't I hidden in Christ? Haven't I been sealed with the Holy Spirit? And you know what he's saying? To take it deeper. He's saying, blessed are you when you go through things and you focus on Christ when you've been approved. What he's saying is, though we've been forgiven, when you come to faith, it isn't just salvation. There's a growth process. 
There's a sanctification process. We get saved. We get sanctified. God helps us and leads us. Amen. And one day we see him face to face and we get glorified. What he means is as you run the race, as you trust in him lowly or making all the money in the world, in the valley or on top of the mountain, what he means is as we live with him, there'll be an evidence in your life that God is leading you. Some of you came in here with your tail between your legs, freaking out. Well, you know what? Praise God, he's with you. You'll feel closer to the Lord today than you might at any other time in your history. Amen? Think about the parable of the sower. What a radical message that there's four people and the word of God is scattered. But what's the parable about? It's that they all seem to listen. They all seem to come to church and they read the bulletin. And we'll we'll hear this guy, Brian, with his funny accent preach for an hour or so. And we'll enjoy food, you know. And and maybe it was emotional. And I love that song. And I know that person. and, And I'm good to go. But the parable of the sower is that only one in four actually has a heart that receives and follows Jesus. The parable of the sower is that, Mark 4, 19. The cares of the world, that could be not having money and needing money. The deceitfulness of riches, self-explanatory. And desires for other things enter and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. James is saying in the midst of it, don't flee. James is saying in whatever you're going through, a basing or a bound, trust in the Lord. And what he's saying is that the evidence for us then that we're in Christ is that we grow all the more as we face some things. Amen? How many of us have met people who were doing well and then suddenly sin shows up and they're wiped out, not in the church? How many were doing well and someone passes away and then they forsake the Lord? Was it one of these things? James, why are you telling us Blessed is the man who endures temptation. And he says in verse 12, For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. As we continue on, well done, good and faithful servants. As we finish life, we will receive this crown of life. And you might picture the crown of life that we see in children's books, and it's gold, and, you know, we're all sitting on thrones, and it's very Burger Kingish. amen? <laughs> this isn't what the Scripture pictures. This crown of life is more like an athlete's wreath, where you run in the Olympics, where you finish the race, and someone shows up and gives you a trophy and puts this crown around your neck. Why this is radical is this is the only time it's mentioned in James's book, but it's mentioned in Revelation 2 and 10. It's mentioned when it's speaking about a certain church that went through hard times, the church in Smyrna. It's the same kind of crown, the crown of life. And this is what John is writing to the church in Revelation 2.10. This is our brothers and sisters. He says, do not fear of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. But be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. As believers, there's a crown of life. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 4.8, there's a crown of righteousness. He says, finally, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who love his appearing. How many live in fear of the Lord coming back? Lord, don't come back when I'm living this way, when I'm doing that, when I'm struggling with this. No, he's saying there's a crown of life. There's a crown of righteousness. And even Peter talks about a a crown of glory. 1 Peter 5, 4. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory. That does not fade away. There's three crowns that we see in these verses. And we think about this and we look to heaven. I say, Lord, what will this be like? But what's amazing is... In Revelation 4, we have this picture of the elders before the Lord in heaven. And the Lord shows up, and some of you know where I'm going. And they have their crowns, and they've ran the race, and all is good. But what does it tell us, Revelation 4 and 10? It says, the 24 elders fell down before him, that's Jesus, who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the what? The throne saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. What the saying is, it's seeing Jesus, looking at Jesus, whatever they've held on to, whatever was of value to them, these crowns of significance, they cast it at his feet. That's where James wants us to look. 
Whatever's going on in your life, focus on Jesus. Those who are going to be thrown from the temple with James, focus on Jesus. The boss that just fired you, focus on Jesus. No one on this planet has robbed one thing for you that God has set apart for you tomorrow. Amen? Don't worry about it. It will be there. I woke up today, early as could be, mind all over the place. Lord, when I get in the pulpit, you're going to meet me there. As I step into this week, Lord, whatever you have for me, you're going to meet me there. James is saying the same thing. And as he does, he again switches gears. He goes back now to being tempted. Listen to verse 13, sorry. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. People were blaming God, blaming others. This is the way I am. This is why my life's this way. This is why this is unfolded like this. And here's what's important to note from last week to this week. is last week when we hear of trials, trials bring out the best in us. Trials cause you to press into God and look more like Jesus. But temptation, temptation brings out the evil in us and calls us to look more like who? The enemy, the devil, sin. Trials will grow you to look more like Jesus while temptation takes us the other direction. If you're familiar with James, last week he said, when you fall into trials, how many of you know you're going to face trials one day? We will. You know what he says in this verse? When he is tempted. You might have walked in here feeling like Mary Poppins or Mr. Rogers, amen? You're going to face some temptations. I don't care who you are, what you struggle with. People have walked through these doors who have been tempted with every kind of sin. I know what's in me. I don't even need to know what's in you. James is saying, oh, you'll face trials, but you'll also face temptation. How can I say that? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Now listen, guys. Would I pick this message to go into? Would I harp on sin for this many minutes? No. But God's the author of his book. I'm going to deliver the message. Amen? 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 13, he says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. All of us are going to face this. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, God will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Temptations are the things that we desire, the things that we want, the things that we think will satisfy. But will they? The Bible says they're fun for a season. Temptations are the things that are win within us. But notice when we read here, he says, with the temptation, God will also make a way of escape. Are you going to live a sinless life? No. But I'll tell you this, you can bypass a lot of the sins you can fall into. Did Adam have to eat of the tree? He didn't. He would have done something, but did he have to eat of the tree? Did David have to sleep with Bathsheba? Do we have to do sinful things? He literally just said, God will give us a way out. The thing we've got to realize about sin is temptation isn't a sin. You are going to face temptation, and when you do, that is the battle. Amen? Hebrews 4.15, you say, Brian, why am I going on about this? I don't know. Marriages fall apart. Someone you've lived with for 20 years, you don't ever see again. Your kids live in a different place. Your bank accounts are split. People take their own lives. We get fired because of sin. We lose friends because of sin. Sin is a big issue, and so much of the church that's the generation below me never speaks about this. James is writing about it. But Hebrews 4.15, it says, We do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet was without sin. What we're talking about here is though Jesus was perfect in my life, I should have grown since 2004 in my faith and say, I know my weaknesses. I know my desires. I know my issues. I know my struggles. Am I going to blame God? Am I going to blame you? Am I going to blame someone else? Or am I going to own it? Because in verse 13, he says, God cannot be tempted by evil. Nor does he himself tempt anyone. People blame God. Someone passes away, this is why I do what I do. Someone lives like this, well, this is the response to this. But James is saying no. In verse 14, we're getting pretty deep here. It's quiet in here, amen? Each one is tempted when he or she is drawn away by what? My own desires. I'm going to own it. 
I'm drawn away when I'm drawn away by my own desires and enticed. And this word for drawn away, you know what it is in the Greek? It's when a hunter would be out there and he would put bait in a field and they would wait until the wild game came out. And I'd look at you and you'd look at me and you'd say, here we go. And we'd wipe that thing out. We draw it out, it would be captured, it would be put to death, it would be slayed. And it says, we're drawn away by our own desires. Desires can be a good thing. Is anyone going to complain that Pastor Rom wanted TK Burger today? I'm sure not, amen? Desiring what's best from your kids, desiring to fill this house, desiring to see people come to faith at Harvest Festival, they are all godly desires. But the way the Bible presents sin in a negative sense, it presents it as a woman alluring victims away, like Proverbs 5.3. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. Oh, sin sounds good. But in the end, she is as bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lay hold of hell. That's how sin looks. It looks great. It tastes good. It's fun to experience. But when you're drawn out into the field, the gun goes off. Here comes a spear or a net. You are trapped in sin. I have to ask myself then, do I know my desires? I don't want to talk about them. 44 years of age, do I know my flesh? I probably do. Do you know what you struggle with? Do you know what you wrestle with? And how are you going to handle that? Do I hide it away for a rainy day? Or do I say, Lord, I'm in church. I'm, I'm bringing it to you. Because here's what we got to realize about our desires. They come from the environment we were raised in. Did mom do this? Did dad do this? Did the older siblings do it? Did they do it in school? Did my cousins do it? Did our environments influence us? All of us know that we're all being advertised to every day. Amen. Look at the next generation. Our phones are selling things to the youth, pushing things. There's always an agenda. We're being influenced and programmed all the time. Growing up in Liverpool, I never went to church. I didn't care about looking like Jesus. Who was I influenced to be? Spider-Man. Amen? <laughs> I wanted to be, what's wrong with Spider-Man? Batman. Amen? Wonder Woman. Spidey. Okay, we're good. Stan Lee. Amen in the back. My point is this. I never thought about looking like Christ, being like God, the words of God. I wanted to be like whoever was in the magazines, whatever was fun and exciting. And then you know what? Why did I get into so many fights growing up? And this is probably true. I watched every Bruce Lee movie on repetition. And what does Bruce do in every movie? Get in a fight with everyone. I'm convinced my sleeves are rolled up because I love the big Boston Fist of Fury movie so much. Amen? You laugh, but I'll speak to your generation. Coming from Liverpool... My mom and dad watching the Beatles, great music, The Doors, Bob Marley, Pink Floyd. But what is the influence on culture? Remember the sexual revolution? Remember the partying, the raging, the romance, the all kinds of out being crazy? I mean, the hippies from the Jesus movement came from that generation, amen? When you think about the talent all these people had, what it also did was influence the world, lead us to have ungodly desires. We all carry them, but they're highlighted they say it takes 0.3 seconds for something to be advertised to you. If I was to hold up an In-N-Out burger right now, I promise you 10% of you would probably go get it on the way home. Amen? All of us have been sold in an environment. We've attached emotions. We've attached feelings. We get something out of these sinful things because we wouldn't do them if that wasn't the case. In a nutshell, we become what we worship. Matthew 15 and 19. Out of the heart, Proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, fault witness, blasphemies. James is talking about our sin, and I have to say, Lord, it comes from within. It influences, but it comes from within. And as Calvary Chapel, we've heard, we wrestle with three things. Wrestle with the flesh, the world, and the devil. The flesh, the world, and the devil, your flesh is opposed, the world is opposed to you, and Satan is opposed to all of it. And sometimes you look at Adam and Eve and I say, man, how could they do this? How could they fall? But if I was to say to you today, what is it that caused Adam and Eve to fall? What would you say? What was it? Was it the fruit? They ate of it. But the Bible says all the Lord made was good. So the tree was actually good. What was it that made them sin? I'm glad you asked, Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw, that's it. When the woman desired, had to have, thought outside of what God had said, 
When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, yet God had given her food, I have to have that food. When she saw and it was pleasing to the eyes, do you see that? I must partake of it. When she saw it was a tree desirable to make one wise, you were with God every day. You could ask him any question. Your marriage is going through it. The kids are going through it. When God responds, it is only godly advice. Amen? No, I don't want that. I want this other knowledge. I want this other wisdom. It wasn't the tree. It was that she saw, and there's three things she was tempted with. Three things, and yet when Jesus baptized in the Jordan, led out to the wilderness... Adam and Eve tempted with three things. How many things was Jesus tempted with? Three things. You know what? Why don't you turn this stone to bread? There's the food. Why don't you throw yourself off the temple and be caught by angels and live a life of comfort? You know what? I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. She was tempted with three things. Jesus was tempted with three things. And you know that you and I are tempted with how many things? 1 John 2.15. Brian, church, make it personal. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's not saying you're not saved, you don't know him. It's saying you're leading to old worldly ways. For all that is in the world, all, he says. And he lists these three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life come not from the Father, but from the world. Eve was tempted with three. Jesus was tempted with three. And Jesus overcame. Thank you, Lord. But we see we face these things. Was he handsome? Was he so nice? Was he the way he needed to be? Was she so pretty? Was she so attractive? Was it more money than you've ever seen? Was it a circumstance you just couldn't pass up? Okay, James, how do I handle this? How do I handle my heart? You've taken it out. You've showed me. This is what's going on in Brian, 44 years of life. Okay, Here's what you should do, James 1.15. When desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to what? Death. Sin isn't always immediate. When someone cuts you off, when you respond to something, when you say something you shouldn't, and the fruit's not there, I get it. But what he's talking about here is he says, when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to what? Death, why are you giving me a picture of pregnancy? Because that is what sin is like. We've put the bait in the field. The term enticed is literally like putting bait on a hook and enticing the fish. How does sin show up in our lives? It is a seed. And then it grows. And then it gains traction. And then we give birth to it. And what is the birth like? It is always only what? Death. It's only death. Sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's spiritual. You think about the things we can do, is that why the marriage broke up? Because it gave birth to death. Think about smacking someone in the face, maybe they smack you back, it gives birth to death. You think about it in the spiritual sense. Adam and Eve fell into sin, God shows up. Where are you, Adam? God knew exactly where he was, but Adam didn't know where he was. Naked in the bushes, that's a spiritual death. Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. God took them. The spiritual death can have a deeper effect because we carry it. And I'm not saying that because you're sitting here thinking about the fight you had with your spouse on the way to church. We've all had them, amen? Grace and mercy, we need it every day for a reason. This is not legalism, holier than thou preaching. This is meeting the rubber where the rubber meets the road. What it's saying is lean into the Lord, beware. Don't just cast everything aside because he says it brings forth death. And even 1 Corinthians 11, speaking on communion, He says, for this reason in verse 30, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. What he's saying is hold yourself accountable. Consider how you're living. Don't step there. Don't go there. Don't do this or do that because you will be birthing death. And if I'm honest, the years of being a Christian, this week having conversations with people, I can't tell you how many people will say, well, Brian, I know we're all just sinners. I mean, look at David, a man after God's own heart. David was a man after God's own heart, amen? He's in the fields, he's worshiping, he's frolicking, he's praising, he's killing this, he's killing that. Hey, some giant shows up. Who does this uncircumcised Philistine think he is? Boom. That's the David I want to associate with. Even when Jesus cleanses the temple, do you know that's the verse that ties Jesus to David because he had zeal for the temple? 
But am I saying we should be like David later on? The Bible says of David, at the time kings go to what? War. David's a king. You're a king, David, right? You're meant to be at what? War. War. You're meant to be living out your call. You're meant to be in the pulpit preaching, Brian, or wherever we're called to be. Ephesians 2.10 is workmanship. At the time, David's meant to be doing what God called him to do. He stayed at home. If he never stayed at home, he wouldn't have seen Bathsheba. Wouldn't have seen Uriah's wife. Wouldn't have checked out a new bikini or a pedicure or whatever all you women get. I don't know. Amen? Wouldn't have noticed her and called for her. And when she showed up, opened the door. Wouldn't have suddenly fornicated, impregnated, lusted. Wouldn't have thought, wait a minute, she's going to have a baby. And I'm going to be the guy who's guilty because her husband's away. So you know what I'm going to do? Uriah, come home. Plotting and scheming. Go lay with your wife, but Uriah, the man of God, said, No, Lord, I'm going to honor you. While my brothers are dying on the battlefields, I'm not going to go pleasure myself. Even though he's allowed to, the king has given him a right of pass. I'm going to honor you, Lord. And David says, This isn't good. I've got to cover this sin. Here's a letter. Take this to your commander. Put Uriah on the front lines. Plotting, scheming, planning, giving birth to Uriah is killed and slain, comes back. Okay, we covered that. No. David is challenged by the prophet. That means God's grace is on you. Amen. The worst thing God can do for you when you're struggling with sin is give you over to it. When he gives you over to it, he's allowing judgment in your life to say, roll with it. See where this plays out. It's only going to give death. David repents, but the child dies, and it follows him for generations. I have to say this to challenge us to say, Lord, help me to be more like David as a youth and not David like this. I don't want this example to be the standard for living in sin. Amen? Ephesians 5.11. He says, I have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. What was it that led David to this sin? When he saw, just like Eve, just like Adam. 1 John 2.15. When Jesus saw what Satan was offered to him, he said, not me. What does Jesus tell us? He doesn't just say, pluck out your eye. Because if I can pluck out my eye, and it's a spiritual principle. I can also put it back in. He says, pluck out your eye and what? Cast it. Get rid of it. Be done with it. Mark yourself. Hold yourself accountable. Why? Because we want to succeed. And why it's amazing the way James writes. And believe me, I'm going all over the place today. But James is the same, so I'm in good company. In James 1, 3 to 4, he says, there's testing. There's patience. There's maturity. Then you're complete. Four things. He talks about what we're going through here. He says there's desires, you're enticed, there's sin, there's death. He's putting trials and temptation alongside of each other. And these are things that should just be known within our church today. When you're going through trials, press in, trust, watch what the Lord does in you. When you're facing hard times, don't give birth. Okay, James, you've had enough, you've beat us up, what shall we do? Verse 16, Brian, church, don't be deceived. You know, don't blame others, don't blame God. Hold yourself accountable. Don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. What a statement. With whom there's no variation and shadow of turning. James is saying, don't be deceived. Don't blame anyone else. Don't be mad at God like Adam was. How did you get here, Adam? The woman you gave me. This is what James is shadowing. The Father of lights, what does that mean? We don't know. Did God create the sun, the moon, the stars? Sure. Did he create all the celestial beings, even the ones who fell? Sure. But what he's saying is in God, there's no shadow of darkness. Nothing is hidden. God is not scheming to get you, calling you to struggle. Oh, he nominated Job. He allowed Peter to be sifted as, sifted as wheat, but Jesus prayed for him. What he's saying is as you walk through it, you should know that from the Father of lights, what comes from him is only good and perfect things. Amen. We worship because God is good. We hear the word of God because God is good. We sit in an altar because God is good. Because God is the same what? Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He tells us how he's good. And how do you know you matter? How do you know that what people have said about you, what you think about yourself, all the junk we've bought in this world, this is what God says of you in verse 18. Of his own will, he brought us, that's you, forth. And by the word of the truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. 
That while we were focused on the tree, while we were desiring this, while we were struggling with all that, all the sins you're going to struggle with and even fall into, God knew before he even made you, yet he still brought you forth. Amen? I'm honest. If you're honest, would you have created all of us if you were God? You're like, really? This is what they're going to do. I mean, they're fighting right now, and politicians are doing this, and the world's doing this, and we've got this island stuff, and we've got all this craziness. I mean, really? And God says, yes. You are of value to him, willing to give his son. Every lie, Brian, every lustful thought, every clenched fist, everything that's in you, even your ego in a pulpit. And we all carry our egos, amen? Did I slip up? Did I say this in the sermon? Who am I? Just like you in your world. That's all of us. But God brought us forth. Why? Because he cared so much about us. And he says then, okay, how should we live? Verse 19. So then, church, my beloved brethren, and this is the kind of commands for how we should live when we face things, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. You know what's amazing about James? Is James focuses so much on our speech, so much on what we say. I'm English, so we talk a lot because when I'm conversing with you, relating back and forth to you, it's a sign of respect. In England, we actually ask questions when we finish our statements. So when I say amen, I'm inviting you into the thought with me. Amen? Amen? Someone missed it in the back, I thought. Amen? <laughs> My point in this is James has focused so much on our speech, and we're in the land of the free. We're in the land that says, I'm just going to tell it like it is. But you know what's true about that statement? Is nothing. No one has ever told it like it is, aside from who? God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. We're living in a land that's like, say whatever you want, do whatever you want, think whatever you want. Yet the philosopher Epictetus, and you've heard this quote, he says, nature has given to men one tongue, but two ears, that we may hear from others twice as much as we speak. You've heard many a pastor say, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. How many fights with our children, fights with our spouse, fights with one another would have been quenched if we used both our ears rather than our mouth, amen? We're always chiming in. We're always saying. We always know what's best. What he's saying here is in the midst of it all, don't get angry. Don't pour out your wrath. Be slow to speak and quick to listen. And Solomon agrees, Proverbs 13, 3, he who guards his mouth preserves his life. How many have died because they couldn't be quiet? But he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Psalm 140.1.3 Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Proverbs 10.19 In the multitude of words, sin is never lacking. But he who restrains his lips is wise. You might have heard the saying, a wise man once said what? Nothing. A wise man once said, nothing that will minister. He says, be slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man, and this is what we should underline, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You're driving home, you're frustrated, someone dropped in on that wave, they took the last whatever, things aren't going the way you want them to. The, the righteousness that's of God is not going to come out of us when we're walking in our wrath. And you may think of people who are angry. You smash this, you get mad, you shout, you're rowdy, you're crazy, but can I tell you this if we're honest? There's just as many people who aren't loud when they're angry. There's just as many people who are quiet, who are bitter, who are judgmental, who will avoid you, who have a problem, who are unforgiving. Whichever situation of anger you carry, whether you're loud and rowdy or whether you're quiet and judgmental, if we live in that state, we will not be bringing forth the righteousness of God. It's important we understand this too about anger. Being angry isn't a sin. It's how we act once we're angry. In your anger, the Bible says, don't sin, Ephesians 4, 26, 27. Be angry and do not sin. That's what I need to underline. When someone comes in here yelling at you, I'm angry. When someone chases your kid around the baseball field, you're angry, amen? When you get into it over something that you know you're right about, you're angry. But Brian, your issue is when you're angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath nor give place to the devil. 
James is writing last week, it's all about trials, but this week it's all about temptations. I don't just mean looking at this. I don't just mean saying that. And it isn't a, a works-based salvation at all. Don't hear that. I would love to be into next week when we get back in a few weeks or the week after we dig into some amazing things. I'm saying, Lord, do you want me to focus this much on sin? I don't know that in two weeks something's going to come into your life and one verse that you might have wrote down, you're going to go back to and say, that's why I won't open the door. That's why I'm not looking at Bathsheba today. That's why I'm not doing this. That's why at the time kings go to war, Lord, I'm standing in the promises of God. Amen? I don't know where you are. I don't need to. The Lord knows. If you want to tell me, I'll pray for you. But how would you close a message like this where there's so much to be said? There's four things I want us to think about. Challenge yourself. Put it on the table. Open your heart and say, Lord, what can I take from this? The first thing is to all of us. The first thing is what am I trusting in? Am I trusting in a better life? Am I looking to greener grass? The famous saying, the grass grows where we water it and where you are planted. Amen. You be where you are and trust in the Lord for tomorrow, but focused on today. We'll have TK Bega. We'll pray. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. We're good to go. What are you trusting in? Are you content with where the Lord has planted you? Because what they said about you, what they did to you, what you're carrying, you're strong enough in the Lord to get through it. You're the testimony. I'm going to send someone to so you can sit and pray with them. You're the living epistle read by all who's faced it, because I may not have. Second thing is, how are we enduring under temptations? Am I better today after prepping this than I was last week? Am I enticed away? Am I hooked like that fish? Am I out in the wild being taken out by hunters? Am I drawn away, enticed by my own desires? We all have them, giving birth to death. Or am I focusing on the crown? Third thing, who are we blaming? Am I blaming God? A lot of people aren't in church because they blame God. God has only been good to us, amen? People say, well, the Old Testament God, he was really angry. Well, don't read the book of Revelation then. It is way worse than the Old Testament, amen? God is a good God. God ministered to Pharaoh. Do you know that? He told him what to do. Pharaoh rejected, hardened his heart. If it was a preacher of righteousness for 100 years, they all could have repented and followers could have all got in the ark. Would have been a different story. All sitting there holding kittens and cats and all the rest. It would have been an amazing story, amen? But they rejected. They had a problem with God. Fourth thing, how are we managing our anger? And don't just think about being loud. Think about if you're quiet. Think about if you shut down. Think about if you're bitter, if you're hate-filled, if you avoid. Are we trusting in the Lord? How are we enduring? Are we blaming God or anyone else? How are we managing our anger? How do you summarize this? Then we'll pray. Philippians 4, 8. Very simple. You know it. Paul says, finally, brethren, Brian, tell the church, Calvary Chapel, listen, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. In a moment when we just respond and sit as they begin to worship, what can you focus on? What can you hold fast to? What can you be thankful for? I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for the food. I'm thankful for the life I've lived in many ways. What can you be thankful for? Because if any of it is good, if one thing is good, that's of the Lord. There's one good memory, one good moment, something you got out of that marriage that maybe has failed today, something your kids said that were good, where other times they said the worst things you could imagine. Meditate on these things. In Proverbs 18.10, you know what it says? The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run to it and are safe. Over being lowly, over being wealthy, over whatever picture you have in your mind, release it all and say, Lord, I'm trusting in you. Who am I holding things against? What am I opposed to? Lord, can I be steadfast? And can we just have the band come up and we're going to begin to worship for a second? Here's all I want to challenge us to do. Just take a minute, two minutes, sit where you are. Hey, this is a pretty heavy topic. Brian spent a lot of time on sin. Maybe that's you, maybe it's not. I heard today maybe I've got anger. Maybe I'm the rowdy one, maybe I'm the quiet one. I heard today maybe I'm trusting in this or that. What would it mean for us to just bow our heads for a minute or so and say, Lord, show me by your spirit 
what I am doing? Let's bow our heads. I'm going to pray. Lord, I pray for us today that we would learn to be slow to speak. Lord, you would help us to speak life and grace and mercy to others. We would speak the truth in love, Lord. At a time when a nation's divided, everyone is rowdy and ready to go and have an opinion, you've called us to speak the truth. That's your word, your grace, your mercy, your love, full of the Spirit in love. Lord, I pray today you help us with our judgment. We might be right about scenarios, but you're the judge, not us, Lord. Help us to be gracious. Lord, I pray today we would learn to forgive even more. Are any of us worth dying for, Lord, based on your standard? No. James 2.10 says, If we've broken the law in one place, we're guilty yet. You, for the joy set before you, went to the cross. Lord, I pray today you would help us with our anger. When the days ran long, when no one listens, when we're being so disrespected, or someone isn't being kind or loving to us, but I pray we would open up our fists and say, Lord, let us be more like you. God, I pray today you would lead us and fill us. And Lord, I even pray that if someone's here who doesn't yet know you, they came into this church and they said, oh, that's how they worship, that's how they sing, that's how they talk. Well, Lord, would you speak to their heart? Would you let them know we're all dead in sin, we all need forgiveness, but you went to the cross for us. You shed your blood so that all of our sins can be forgiven, theirs included, that there's none who are good enough, no one, and that whatever our sin is, our struggles are, Lord, you've made a way out, first and foremost, we can be saved and forgiven, but also in our struggles, Lord, we have you, the comforter, the helper, to walk with us. And Lord, just for the next few moments as we worship, before we break bread and eat, would you just give us a moment of your sweet presence, of your grace and mercy as we leave to say, Lord, thank you for the word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the body of Christ. Lord, I pray that anyone needs to confess, confesses. Anyone needs to press in, presses in. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, we're going to worship, and I'm going to come down to the front. If you need prayer for anything, something as sudden as today that is urgent, I'll be down here. Maybe some others will join me. If you're here, you want to get right with God, come and tell me. I want to pray with you to God in heaven for your sins, for you to be redeemed. Amen? Let's worship him, church. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Guys, thank you for listening, tuning in, spending time. Please be praying. Thank you for the partners. Hey, there's more schools coming up, more ministry, more outreach. So much coming up on the schedule. But as I said, I am jumping into James, committed at this home church that's asked me to kind of fill the pulpit. And my own church saying, yeah, go ahead. This is amazing. We support you as a ministry partner. I get to kind of serve there as if the Apostle Paul sent and said, Brian, can you encourage and bless them using your time, your treasure, your talents, which we all have. So with that, what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 1.18? The message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but to us who are being saved. It's the power of God. Love you guys. Hope to see you out on the road. Be sharing and caring for people. The Lord is returning at some point, and while here, and we have breath and life, he has empowered us, Acts 1-8, to go out and proclaim the truth. At BrianSumner.net for more. God bless you guys. Mm -hmm.